The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome everyone to today's Scout and Denali webinar, True Stories Accelerating Time to Value with a Sourcing Desk. Before we jump into the content, I'd like to begin with a couple of short housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and the replay will be sent to the email you use to register. If you have any questions, please submit them using the questions box in the GoToWebinar side panel and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenters, David Gonzalez, Director of Program Ma Management and Solutions at WNS Denali. David is a director for Denali with 10 plus years of experience in procurement advisory and managed services. David oversees a portfolio of Fortune 500 retail and CPG clients focused on delivering global source to contract managed services. David has an MBA from the W.P. Carey School of Business at Arizona State University. He resides in Seattle, Washington. And Stan Garber, president and co-founder of Scout RFP. He got his start in entrepreneurship early, founding Onesis, while he was still a student at Case Western Reserve University. His experiences at Onesis, which was acquired by Living Social in 2012, made him acutely aware of the need for a simple yet effective strategic sourcing tool, which led him to co-found Scout in 2014. David, take it away. Thank you, Amanda. Good morning. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. I'm excited for the opportunity to present. Um, just briefly wanted to introduce Denali to the audience. Uh, Denali provides end-to-end -end sourcing and procurement solutions to some of the world's largest and leading brands. Uh, we provide a complete range of solutions across the source-to-pay lifecycle, including category management enablement, strategic sourcing, sourcing and contract execution, as well as procure-to-pay operations and analytics. Um, our collaborative and flexible approach allows us to meet our clients wherever they are in their journey, uh, helping them to, to make a strategic impact on their organizations. Um, so for today's topic, what I wanted to do first was to level set with everyone around goals and metrics within a, a global procurement organization. What we see is many times people talk about just cost savings. Um, but we find with our clients that really they're focused on three major goals. The first of which is reach. And reach is really all about how do you increase your spend under management? How do you influence more spend decisions? And what we think is the best in class procurement teams are able to achieve 80% spend under management on addressable spend year over year. So that's a goal that we see with a lot of our clients. The second goal is focused on cost savings. It's around effectiveness. How do you maximize the total business value delivered? Um, definitely continues to be an important metric and goal for, for our clients and for global procurement organizations. And the third metric or goal is around efficiency. I think we all hear as practitioners in the world of sourcing that procurement and the procurement process is too slow, that it takes too much time to get support from procurement and to get the contract signed, and, and, and that whole process is too slow. So one thing that's really important, and we see a lot of our clients measuring, is their cycle time, and how can they improve their speed to be able to go back to their business and explain to them that, you know what, procurement's not slow, and here, I can show you why we're not slow and we have the data to support it. So we see these three goals and metrics as really what are, are critical for global procurement organizations moving forward. Um, this is important because if, as we go to the next slide, the challenge that we're seeing with many of uh, our clients and with many sourcing managers is today the traditional operating model for procurement is inefficient and it does not align well to those strategic goals that we just talked about. What we find is category managers or sourcing managers are bogged down in tactical work today. They spend about 80% of their time doing what we would consider to be transactional work or our execution type work, and they're not focused on this, the strategic activities. Um, where they need to be getting to is where they're spending 80% of their time on strategic activities, 
and then they are outtasking or they are outsourcing the tactical activities to the most efficient and effective team. You know, the, the common example that I like to give um, is you talk to sourcing managers and they'll say, hey, David, you know, I'm responsible for the $10,000 contract negotiation and I'm also responsible for the $10 million strategic negotiation, right? There's this huge range of what sourcing managers are responsible for. And it just, in, in, today's, in today's modern business world, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And it's really important that organizations, if they wanna hit those goals around reach, effectiveness, and efficiency, can shift the, their operating model to be more strategic. So to change the game, it's it's our it's our mindset that procurement needs excuse me procurement teams need to segment their work. They need to separate the tactical execution from the strategic tasks to be able to accomplish the goals that they have set. And what you see here is uh, you know a standard source to pay life cycle. And what we believe is that teams that are able to achieve their strategic goals for the organization are able to segment their work between category management, source to manage, and rep to pay. And they organize their, their departments to be able to accomplish this work. So the first one is category management, right? We believe strongly that you need to have a category management team that is focused on category strategy, they're focused on building strategic relationships with their business partners, forecasting the next six to 12 months worth of work, and really almost operating as portfolio managers, managing specific categories. And when you do that, you really are going to increase the reach within, within your organization and the spend that you're able to influence. In the middle of the screen around sourcing, uh, source to manage, it's all about execution. And this is where the concept of a sourcing desk comes into play. We believe that you should have a sourcing execution team where the primary focus is managing and executing all RFPs, managing, executing all contracts, providing market intelligence, um, providing auctions in the form, auctions as a way to do some negotiations. All of that work should be in the sourcing execution team or what, I, or what we call a sourcing desk. And then downstream, it's about a tactical or transactional execution team. And as much as possible, you wanna drive automation here, where you can, where you have standard processes. If you can move those to be fully automated, that's absolutely what you should do. But this is really all about increasing compliance and ensuring that you're managing the, the risk of the organization. Um, so we believe strongly that Segmenting your work across the source to pay life cycle is going to help you as an organization achieve your goals. So let's, let's double click a bit on this concept of a sourcing desk. Uh, many, many of you have recently Im implemented out as your e-sourcing tool and your platform for all management of RFPs and of running auctions and whatnot. Um, now it's the question is, well, what do you do with it? And how, how best do you go about um, rolling out that, that technology to your organization? Uh, what we have found is that clients can be very successful by creating a centralized sourcing desk to support them in the rollout of a tool such as Scout. And many of our clients have chosen this path and it's been successful for them. What I wanted to do here was to give you some tips and tricks to get yourself started if you wanted to evaluate this concept of a centralized sourcing desk and put together a plan to do it. I'll tell you point blank, yes, Denali can provide a sourcing desk. We're very strong at doing that. But in many cases, clients are looking to use their own resources and thinking about how they can do it themselves. And so hopefully this will give you uh, some ideas to be thinking about. So the, the framework here is a very simple framework of people, process, and technology. 
Um, and what I want to do is kind of double click in each area to give you some things to think about. So from a people aspect, we believe strongly that if you're going to do a sourcing desk, it needs to be a centralized team with the primary focus of sourcing execution. That should be their role. They should be, become process experts in terms of managing RFPs, RFIs, running auctions, doing that type of, those type of tasks. We also think it's important that you align that team by your key spend categories. Um, we have many clients where, for instance, the technology category or professional services category are key categories where there's a high volume of transactions, there's a lot of spend, there's strategic suppliers involved. It's important that your sourcing desk is organized such that there's repeatability, um, there's a level of comfort in the people that are managing those categories. And then the third piece is around um, minimizing handoffs. So one thing that we hear from business stakeholders or budget owners is they don't necessarily know who to contact about their project, right? And they start maybe with a sourcing manager and then they get handed off to a legal contact and then maybe somebody in controlling when it's, when it's time to, to pay the vendor. Um, what we would recommend is you try to minimize handoffs with the sourcing desk. So having that, that, that partner from the sourcing desk kind of facilitate and own the project from beginning to end would, would be a best practice. In terms of process, uh, the first thing that we recommend is defining the different project tiers with, with it that will come into the sourcing desk. So a, a, a very standard approach that we use is we, we define projects by complexity level, what we call simple, standard, or complex. Some people will say small, medium, or large. There's a lot of different ways that you could come up with it. But the idea here is that every project that comes in to the sourcing desk is getting defined and you can understand, okay, what's the level of effort? What's the business risk? Is this a strategic project or is this a standard project? And you're able to kind of resource against it and have a plan to support it. So definitely recommend um, this idea of creating project tiers to help you when you're thinking about a sourcing desk. Also from a process perspective, we recommend um, coming up with a standard sourcing process. So at Denali, we use a six-step sourcing process. Obviously, out in industry, people talk about a seven-step or a five-step. You can create as many or you can minimize as many steps as you want. But the idea here is that you have a standard, repeatable sourcing process and methodology. This not only helps your suppliers so that they can be comfortable with every time they get a project from, from your organization, they can expect kind of how the, the sourcing process will flow, but also it helps your business stakeholders, right? Because it helps them understand um, what, where we are, what stage we're in, what they can expect for the next stage, and there's some repeatability there. The last piece is around category playbooks. And this kind of goes back to, in the people section around category alignment, you, for your key spend categories, we, we believe it makes sense to create an operating playbook which talks about what is, the, what is the strategy of this category, who are our preferred suppliers, who are our internal key business stakeholders, and it's a, it's a desktop tool that can be utilized by your sourcing desk team to make sure that they understand um, the nuances of each individual category. The last piece is around technology. Um, clearly, Scout is a partner of Denali, and they provide excellent technology um, and are a great option for many of our clients in terms of wanting to set up a sourcing desk. We recommend utilizing their intake tool um, and having a, a, a central, what I like to call a centralized funnel for project intake on anything that the sourcing desk will touch. So that intake provides an opportunity for triage. It provides an opportunity to make sure that we know who should be working on the project and, and assign it to the right team. Um, it's definitely something that, you know, we see helping organizations to kind of simplify the engagement with their business stakeholders. Also through technology, 
uh, you can create templates. And templates are going to drive efficiency and help you with your cycle time, right? This is around having a standard RFP template, having a standard RFI template, having a standard auction template that you can utilize um, and, and continue to, to, to utilize on a re repeatable basis. So have, and, and you know, we, I've seen examples within clients where they have templates that are kind of holistic in nature, but then they also have it by category or they have it by geography, right? So they have templates that are um, localized for specific countries, if that, if that makes sense, or they have them for um, certain categories that, where, where maybe it's, you know, I think about software, right? And software, uh, software as a service typically has its own set of requirements versus maybe a professional service agreement. So templates can really be something that you can utilize to help you drive efficiency through your sourcing desk. And then the last piece is around reporting. I think if you're going to invest in a sourcing desk and you're going to invest in this centralized team, you need to be able to, to show the results, right? And you need to be able to report out on the number of projects or the count, um, the total spend that is running through your sourcing desk. Um, the savings that have been achieved, and then also around cycle time, right? And really what you want to, what you want to get to is be able to demonstrate to your leadership the benefits of a, of, a, of a centralized sourcing desk team. So let me stop there real quick to see if there's, there's any initial, initial questions. Hey, David, this is actually Stan. Um, you know, what I thought, what did, when you think about, because I know one of the questions that a lot of our customers sometimes sort of bring up, like, when should we look at a, a, a sort of a, a sourcing desk or buy desk? Like, what, uh, like how, do, how, what types of organizations and w what you've seen, because you've done this for a while now, like, how should companies think about, like, when is it time to even look at something like that? When, from like objectives or goals, like, when, when is it, when is it appropriate time to even think about uh, setting it up and why should they set it up? Yeah, I think definitely it's a couple of things. I, and, and we have a couple of case studies here that we'll, we'll talk about to, to, sh to share a bit more. But typically what we see is if there's a high volume of transactions that, uh, that require sourcing that are, that are coming through the tool, right, um, and the team is just doesn't have the capacity and the bandwidth to support all of that work, um, it makes some sense to say, okay, this is a time to kind of carve out and invest in a, in a centralized team to do this work. And it kind of free up those sourcing managers to focus on other responsibilities. So usually it's a spike in volume that can be one of the driving forces. Um, another one is uh, around cost savings. Um, and sometimes there's goals that need to be achieved and the team may be behind and they're looking for ways to, to accelerate those cost savings uh, captures, right? And so that's another a, another example. And probably the last one I would say is, you know, it can be by ca almost by category. So I think sometimes people have this idea that, oh my God, to do a centralized sourcing desk or a centralized team, you know, we have to provide it to all of the categories, to all of the geographies, and it's got to be almost this kind of big bang approach to get started. And I think we've seen many clients who have said, hey, we see value in this, but we want to start small. And we want to start with one category, one geography, one set of category managers, let's say, and let's see if it works. And let's kind of test drive it a bit. And if we see some traction and we see some value and it's freeing up our sourcing managers, it's allowing us to respond back to our business stakeholders in a more efficient way. Um, then we'll we'll expand it and we'll add more categories and more geographies at a later time. So those are, I mean, just kind of how I've seen examples of clients get started and kind of the justifications for why they got started. Great. Okay, so let's uh, let's just go right into the case studies. <clears throat> so the first case study that I have to share is a client of ours that is a Fortune 500 coffee, beverage, and, and, food, te and food retailer. Um, we're providing a global sourcing execution program for this client. Their challenge, their business challenge, 
a couple of years ago was all about cost savings. Uh, their, their business was expanding globally and the global sourcing team was being pressured to deliver cost savings to help fuel that growth. They were limited on what they could do with their internal resources to achieve those targets. And so they needed to bring in a partner like Denali to help them um, achieve those annual savings targets. So our solution for this client was to bring in a dedicated team. They were on site. Um, it was a, re a team of up to re 12 resources to provide market intelligence, provide data analytics, provide sourcing execution, and some end-to-end -end strategic sourcing support. We found that, we, and also Scout was part of this as well, right? I'm using Scout's technology to help drive that sourcing execution. Um, and the results have, have been excellent. And in a 12-month period, um, our team was able to help them influence an additional $650 million in spend. We were able to help them realize $25 million in savings. Uh, we completed almost 100 projects, what we would consider to be a project. A project can, can, you know, can include a, an RFI, an RFP, um, and a contract all in one, right? So there was definitely a traction of work that we were able to do there. And then we were able to support them across a variety of their business units and their partners. This is a great example of where um, this concept of having Denali as your centralized sourcing team um, could really enable these category managers to, to achieve their objectives in terms of their annual cost savings goals. And that program is now going into its third year and continuing to drive savings year over year and seeing really strong results through, through a program like this. The second case study that I have for you, and this one is my last slide, is um, a case study with a Fortune 500 consumer product goods company. And it's, it's, it's an interesting um, example where not only are we providing sourcing execution, but we're also providing some category management enablement and also some, some downstream contracting support. The business challenge here was around operating model, kind of what I was talking about in the beginning. You know, our clients' category managers were being consumed by some tactical tasks and responsibilities. Their team was not spending adequate time with their, with their key business stakeholders. They were not able to invest time in building out their category strategies. And therefore, everything was kind of reactive in nature, right? They were, they were just responding to requests that come in from the business instead of being able to proactively forecast the work. Our solution in this case was to implement a source to contract team of nine resources to provide category management enablement, strategic sourcing, contract execution, and analytics. And we're focused primarily in our clients' corporate indirect categories, including, including marketing, facilities, and corporate services. So this is a good example of where it's not holistic in nature, touching all of the indirect and direct categories, but rather it's a, it's a focus in specifically the indirect categories. Um, the results have been excellent over the last two years. Uh, we've touched about 200 million in spend, 300 plus projects, we are also tracking customer satisfaction on projects. I think that's an important metric um, that many of our clients want to know. They want to know from our business stakeholders how what was their support like from procurement on this specific transaction. So we we capture that and we measure that and we re report back on it. Um, definitely, cost savings are there, and we've helped them to generate 13 plus million in cost savings. And then we're also tracking our cycle time um, and making sure that we report out on it and looking for ways that we can continue to drive efficiency in terms of our average project cycle time. This is also another client that is utilizing Scout as their technology platform to be executing their RFPs. Uh, so our team is using Scout for all of the sourcing execution with this client. 
Okay, that's my last slide, Amanda. I, I know I moved pretty quickly, but I'll, I'll, I'll hand it back to you for now. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, David, actually, this, we, we did get a question from Kurt that came in. Um, I'll just read it off to you. When, when a company decides to build out the, these capabilities, is there a sequence to focus on each or, na or a natural order when a, uh, what comes first? For instance, do you build out the technology piece first, then sourcing team, and lastly, uh, category management team? Good question. Good question. So I've seen it a couple of different ways. Um, many of our many of our clients, and I think you know, Stan, you would know this uh, in our partnership, right? We, we come to the table with with both. Um, so they're they're looking for help. They're looking to solve a business problem, let's say around capacity, and and they're looking at it both from a um, from a labor stand, standpoint or, or a people standpoint, as well as a technology standpoint. And through our partnership, we can come to the table and say, hey, here's an example of how we could support you with Scout. Um, in some cases, I think uh, it is about technology first and the client wanting to make investments in technology, then making those investments and struggling with, well, how do we now drive the most out of this technology? and then they want to utilize a partner like Denali to help them get there. So I've seen it, I've seen it both ways. Um, what, I mean, what would you say from your perspective? Yeah, I would, uh, I would, I would agree with that. We've seen it both ways. Um, I definitely, I mean, beyond technology, I think, I, I think category planning is an important piece to do up front uh, when you think through the sequencing of events, because technology in, in our standpoint, is going to be an enabler in the process, right? It's, it's not going to ultimately lead to the end result. It's going to automate, help put it on path and track to make sure you're getting there. Um, so as part of that, and I know working with Denali uh, a lot of ways before you jump in and start doing things, step one is to lay out the category plan. Uh, it really is yep. to have some level of understanding what we want out of it. And uh, before we just start going out and running, because really quickly you can get bogged, you can lose sight of track by doing tactical things very quickly. You'll get some quick wins, which is a necessary part of the job. But it's like, what's the what's it look like 12 months? What's it look like 24 months and 36 months from now? Um, and that's where when, when we'll get through this, I'll give you a quick overview on Scout, like how you, you, you can visually lay this out so you actually have the optics around that because that's part of the category plan too and it forces you to do that. So they go hand in hand, but the conversation I almost think up front should be actually what is the plan, what are the categories, what are the functions we're doing and put in partnering up with technology and then tra tracking it. And if you're having an outsourced team, uh, like having the technology actually be the uh, sort of the, the checker in this process uh, to make sure everybody's staying on track, doing everything and are we actually hitting our goals? Yeah, it's a great point. It makes me, it just makes me think one of the, you know, one of the fundamental questions needs to be around, do you want your sourcing managers or category managers in this case running RFPs? Do we, do you consider that to be a core function or a core role responsibility for a category manager? And I think what I see with many of my clients is the answer is no, not in today's world. They do not want them spending time running RFPs. They want them to give that to a team to execute it on their behalf. And they want those category managers focused on what you were describing, Stan, in terms of category plans, being very close to the business, forecasting the work over 12, 24, 36 months, um, and, being a, and being really much more a strategic business partner. And building way. relationships with the business, like because it requires you to, a lot, to do a lot of selling. You have to spend time with the stakeholders, sit with them, work with them, figure out their projects, talk to FPNA, what's planning, what's going on. It's just a lot of work. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. Um, yeah. So, and I know we've got a few more questions. Uh, we're going to do is just walk through. I just have a few quick slides, a little bit about Scout and, and sort of supporting, especially the outsourced piece of it, and just a little bit background on ourselves. And then we'll we'll start going through a few handful of questions coming in as well. So, a little bit about Scout, and as David alluded to, we've had a chance to work. Uh, we have a fantastic relationship with Denali and, and the whole organization on several customers now, where Scout is, uh, has been helping, sort of being the the, the actual technology used to help drive some of the outsource efforts and organize and tracking of it. Um, and the whole, uh, the really the, the unique thing about Scout and how we came to market, we've been in the marketplace for about five years now, um, and we came in and just had a slightly different approach. Uh, when we looked in, and brought the Scout into the, into, into the world, really, the company, we looked at it for um, how, how are consumer-facing companies, when you think of uh, online portals like Amazon, Zappos, 
Uber, uh, others, like how do they get such high adoption and utilization across the world? And, and there was three principles that we actually found when we did a lot of research and spoke to a lot of folks. And the three things that they focused on when they bring these types of applications is this concept of high adoption, time to value. As consumers, we want to be able to get something right away and have instant, uh, instant gratification almost. And then this idea for an enjoyable experience. It should be simple when, there, when things do happen, support should be behind it in, in the most delightful way. Uh, and these principles, and when we thought about it, we said these actually are what we want to go to market and think about a scout in a space that typically today wasn't focusing on these things. It was a lot of, let me build out every single feature requirement and tool set around it. And the usability was a byproduct of it. What was sort of thought, it was a second thought, if not even a third thought. Um, for us, we said it can't just apply to end users. Because if you really want a workbench and a way to collaborate with everybody within a, within a sourcing process, which touches so many individuals, on average, a decision, even in like small companies, 5.3 people uh, are, are involved according to CEB. So when you think about it, how do you actually get the stakeholders? How do you bring the suppliers in? All in one viewpoint. So it's just really simple and really easy to be able to jump in and actually organize the data sets. Um, so when we launched Scout five years ago, we didn't know much about the industry when we just started because we were on a completely different side. We were selling software in a different vertical. We went out, spoke to individuals, and we, we ended up speaking to almost 300 different sourcing leaders. Uh, our first big pain point that we thought of was the RFX, just the simplicity of running bids. And what we found out when we interviewed all these folks, uh, a vast majority of teams weren't utilizing products today. Even though they had purchased, it became shelfware very quickly. Adoption was non-existent. So we really came to market with the very simple idea of a one-page interface. How do you launch sourcing uh, very quickly without any training? One page, you can run three bids in a buy or you can run a half billion dollar bid uh, right through a one-page interface. An auction should not take days and weeks to set up. It should be literally a few minutes. And that was, that was the initial impetus behind Scout, is just the simplicity, ease of use. And, and we'll talk a little bit about the results that we've seen with it. But really quickly on, and this is very important on how, especially working with Denali, what came to just a, about a year into the mix, what we started hearing from our customers a lot was, you know what, we went back and we started asking, how are you running? How are you running sourcing events? What other things are happening? And what we found out was categorically, customers, when they were running the sourcing events, they were great, but there's a lot of things you're doing outside of sourcing, just RFXs, et cetera, renegotiations, performance reviews. Uh, supplier innovation, et cetera, and just savings justifications. And really, it was all done in, in, in Excel. It was all done in SharePoint. Um, a lot of technologies that wasn't a collaborative uh, front of it and really allowed a lot of team members to actually work together. So we came to market and we actually, uh, Scout, in essence, uh, transformed itself much more of a platform over the last few years. And it starts with this idea of intake. With intake, it's the, it's the ability for a stakeholder to actually start the conversation, request something from the business, and they're not just putting a ticket in, they're jumping into something called the pipeline, which is a workbench for the whole organization. So it's one place where everybody can come in uh, from the sourcing team and quickly see what am I working on, what projects are upcoming, uh, track your savings, your justifications. A true workbench, the equivalent of how sales uses uh, uh, CRM solutions like Salesforce, uh, IT uses ticketing like ServiceNow or Jura, no different than HR uses Workday and other tools. It's this whole idea of a true workbench for the sourcing function. And how to, and as, as you saw the model with, with David's talking about, a lot of the strategic work requires a lot of conversations, a lot of planning, data collections, and where is that all being placed and organized in statuses. Uh, and today it's just, it's in SharePoint, it's an email, Google Drive, Smartsheets. It's not one centralized way. And we sort of looked at it and said, there's a huge opportunity to build almost a CRM solution for sourcing, thus pipeline. Uh, and then sourcing and auctions is still part of the product. And as the year, as over the last few years, we've, we've rounded out the solution with contracting and uh, the ability to put in contracts, alerting, reporting on it, and then ultimately supplier performance management. And why that's important is the process is not linear today. Folks work no different than a sourcing event to running. Things move from left to right all the time, and they don't go in a sequence, of, a sequence set of events anymore. Things will come up naturally all times, and being able to go from ongoing, from contract renegotiations, to actually having those feed your pipeline, supplier performance as things come up, it's a flywheel. As you sort of go through, spend a few years into it, and having the outsource team as, as you're organizing all this, having this all in one place, as you bring in more resources, as other folks leave to transition out, 
the ability to understand everything that's happened three years up to that point that's led you to this conversation you're about to have with the supplier is critical to be able to have that in one line of sight and have a bird's eye view as, 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 you, as you develop a, a category plan to be able to see where all of that information is at any given time. So that, that's the makeup of the platform today and how we think of it. Uh, a lot of, and with Denali, we, the intake pipeline and sourcing uh, for both of the examples that David just talked about, those are some of what the customers are using today to run that. And then they've also standardized where their current sourcing teams, even internally, certain category leaders and others, that's how they're actually tracking their projects. That's how they're actually tracking their sourcing events as well. So it works on both sides. Um, and for us, it's, it's all about time to value. As I sort of alluded to right in the beginning, uh, one thing that we're really proud of when, when we went into the market and just 89% of our customers can deploy within, uh, within, within literally a week, a lot can deploy within a day. Um, and David, I know you could attest to this, just as some of the customers that have come on board, like training your team, it's basically, the, we just give them access. I don't even know if we've done formal training. Maybe the Denali team has directly, but it, your team just, it's, it's, if you can write an email in, in Google, you can use Scout in essence is the whole idea. Yeah, absolutely, Stan. I, I, yeah, I mean, our teams, you know, within Denali, our delivery teams just rave about using the tool. It's just intuitive. It's straightforward. Um, you know, I've joked with people over the years that some of the other providers, you know, they hand you a, a binder with, you know, 200 pages in it and say, hey, here's your owner's manual, right? Um, and that's never something that we've needed for Scout. It's just something we pick up and we use it right away. Yeah. Um, just a few, few quick last slides, and then we'll jump into some questions and really more dialogue across the board. Um, from our standpoint, we've been around in the marketplace for just, like I said, just, uh, just about five years. Uh, 200 plus customers using the product today. And the idea is that it's really vertical agnostic, as you can sort of tell from software to manufacturing to retailers, uh, financial groups, healthcare, a bunch of different companies are using it, both indirect versus the direct side uh, and, and many different facets. And, and companies like Uber, Salesforce, they literally rolled out Scout in one day uh, on, on their sourcing organization team to run projects. We did the training first thing in the morning, but by five o'clock, the first projects went live. And all of this wouldn't be possible really without the end result of, of when I talked about the enjoyable experience as one of the last values for us. Uh, and, and it is this ease of use and, and part of the reason why we've seen so much tremendous growth and adoption uh, in, in the program. It really is, is when you think about the customer satisfaction around it. Um, and Gartner was, uh, just uh, gave us the Customer Choice Award this past year. Uh, we're one of the highest rated platforms out there in the marketplace today by Gartner. If you go to Peer Insights, uh, if you just go to Gartner.com forward slash reviews, uh, they've launched a whole peer-to-peer -peer insights of very similar to Yelp uh, for the business side. So it's direct interviews and questions being answered by customers. And it's all free. One thing probably Gardner doesn't, doesn't require from a cost standpoint, but it's really nice to be able to go in uh, and to look at that data sets. And for us, we read that in very, very, um, with, with, with a lot of care because there's great feedback, the pluses, the minuses. Everybody's very honest about that. We have, we have no way to control any of that feedback around that. Uh, so we take that very, we read those very carefully and get the feedback from customers because there's a lot in there. And overall, the biggest thing that you get is just ease of use and how easy like a platform is to enable. And, and that's the underlying theme. When you think beyond even uh, any, like there's just a natural trend happening in, in our industry. When you think of software and technology, this idea of the consumerization of the enterprise, taking everything you and I use today from, from apps to ordering food online to any, it has to be simple and intuitive. Very complex problems to solve, but this idea of putting a UX UI layer around it and making it really simple is critical. Uh, and technology as a whole, uh, when you're enabling, especially when you're doing an outsource center or a call desk, being able to give the different team members really easy technology to use so that you as the business and them, them as the service providers, uh, or even because it's obviously with different continents geographically set apart, it's like how it, it's really how can you make this all work? and make it very simple. And that's a big, big focus in today's marketplace, giving consumer grade uh, UX UI to enterprise grade companies. And that's how we think about it here at Scout and, and how we've been able to adapt so quickly and working with Denali and the team, we've seen tremendous success with that in this particular idea of really looking at how do you actually bring some more efficiency to the process with having your team members uh, really s pivot into much more strategic leaders and giving them uh, individuals that can help with the tactical and sourcing side of the house. So that's a little bit about Scout and sort of how we came about into it. I know we've got a few questions that have already been teed up here. 
Um, I'm sure if we want to, uh, if you want to jump on some of these. Sure, sure. And also just a quick reminder, if you do have any questions, please submit them via the GoToWebinar side panel in the questions box. Uh, we do have a few that have already come in. Um, this first one is, have you seen a trend toward focusing on other metrics besides cost savings for sourcing success? Also, have you seen sourcing desks implemented in non-mandated sourcing environments? Yeah, yeah, good question. Well, definitely on the first part around metrics, um, yeah, I think it goes back to kind of what we talked about at the very beginning. I mean, many of our clients are definitely focused on cost savings, but it's only one of, of a handful of metrics, right? Um, increasing spend under management, driving that reach into the organization is absolutely a metric that we're seeing many of our clients uh, me measure and track, and they really want to get to this idea of around 80% of spend under management, addressable spend, right, on an annual basis. Um, and then also the speed piece of it, right? I'll go back to improving your cycle times because we continue to hear from clients and we continue to hear from business partners that the procurement process or procurement is too slow. You know, and some of it's unfortunate, right? Because they, they lump procurement in with legal and they lump them in with finance and they just say procurement is slow. And so, wanting to be able to measure and track project cycle time and, and look for opportunities to improve speed is definitely a metric that we see. Um, in terms of the concept around mandated versus non-mandated, I mean, I'd tell you the two case, the two case studies that I provided are absolutely non-mandated environments where procurement needs to build the relationship with the business partners to funnel the work into the organization. Um, and so I think I'm finding more and more that it, it's not so much of a policy driven, you must use procurement and therefore use the sourcing desk type approach, but really it's about um, partnership and e explaining to the business how you can help them drive more value and help them focus on what they should be focused on and support them through that process. So, yeah, we do have some clients that are, are mandated, but I would actually say the majority of our clients are more of a non-mandated environment. David, those, those are great across the board. Um, uh, the only thing I, I would even add on to that is just more of like, because you talked about the satisfaction score. Uh, it's just more or less because at the end of the day, functionally, it's the, the business uh, savings is a goal, but sourcing that in most of our customers' cases, they're viewed as the uh, uh, the, the actual business is the customers that they have to go serve. Uh, so like having those satisfaction scores, um, maintaining that because yeah. ultimately that gets you the highest adoption across the board. Uh, so scorecarding the business on are you delivering those elements across the board is is a huge piece of that. Um, so having some level of way to loop back of uh, is the business satisfied and will the business come back to you? It's almost an MPS like score. Yeah, great point, Stan. I would, and we that typically is a key, a key uh, performance indicator that we're measured on as well. Yeah, good point. Great. Uh, next question is: I like the idea that a request for a product slash service to be added to the pipeline, and the data must be consistent, and that makes the process more uniform and consistent. Um, but what do you do? What do we do when a product or service is highly specialized, and the, the development of specifications? requires high levels of supplier collaboration and early involvement. Do those sourcing events happen outside of the scout process? Long question. But. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's, that's a fantastic question because obviously uh, the biggest thing that you, the, the biggest negative sometimes comes to people's mind that says, hey, well, I have a very unique item. I'm doing custom development, bill of materials. It's a marketing campaign. It's something unique. Like I don't want to go through an RFP process. And and I, I completely agree with that statement to a certain point. Um, and where I think that uh, technology can help enable, instead of viewing it as an RFP, it's really, uh, if there is a market for it, obviously you're gonna go to a few suppliers, but if it's even a single source event, we have a lot of our customers actually going through innovation projects with, uh, instead of calling it an RFP, it's a request, it's an information gathering, it could be an innovation project. You literally, it's, a, it's just really textual in the naming convention. Um, so we have customers that have actually set up different forms because you can do a one-on-one -on -one communication or one-on-one -on -one data collection from a supplier. Um, I mean, and they don't they don't even know that they're the only ones in it per se, uh, but you can make it seem like that way. So we've had a lot of marketing bids, a lot of construction bids, 
a lot of things that require design, architecture, creativity, uh, and then even innovation projects where team members are actually sourcing that innovation from suppliers. And they're using Scout as more of a mechanism to organize and engage uh, and, to, and to really pass back and forth that information. So by no means do you have to use the, like the, typically traditionally, yes, you're gonna get an RFP, here's the commodities, here's the side-by-side -side pricing. Uh, that's one traditional way of using it. But think of it as, as a way to, in, to engage the suppliers in a lot of different communication. And then the front side of pipeline, it's a way to actually start the conversation internally so everybody can be aligned on what they're gonna think, what they're actually gonna talk about, what they wanna capture with the supplier before you go out and capture that data from that supplier. Good question. Great. Um, next question is, what best practices can you offer on how to manage clients and suppliers? Which relationship does the category manager and sourcing desk own, and how do they work together? Yeah, I can take the lead on that one. Um, so from my perspective and what we've seen be successful with, with, our, with our clients is category managers should absolutely own the business stakeholder relationship. Right, they should be spending most of their time focused on um, understanding their business partners' needs, um, helping them to forecast future work, and making sure that procurement is there to, to support them through that process. Um, I would also say that typically uh, those category managers are responsible for key supplier relationships as well. Right, so if they if they have a well-defined category strategy and plan. Then they will include key. They'll include um, their key supplier relationships, and typically they're really going to focus on those. Let's say top, you know, three to five suppliers and managing those partnerships. Um, the sourcing desk comes into play in terms of managing the the rest the, the rest of the suppliers, and and really kind of managing that process and driving consistency and repeatability through the process. I, I mentioned that a little bit earlier, that this idea that if that if a supplier you know, comes and does maybe 10 RFPs a year with your organization, they always they, they know coming in that they're all going to have a consistent look and feel. There's a level of professionalism, a level of standardization that they can expect by working with your organization. And that's definitely the responsibility uh, and expectation of the sourcing desk to, to provide that consistency. Um, and so that's typically what we see in terms of how you would kind of divide the two. Um, but definitely the sourcing desk, you know, if there's issues in, a, in an RFP and let's say um, an incumbent supplier is frustrated with not being awarded the business, then that sourcing desk needs to make sure and circle back with that category manager and make them aware of the situation and help them if there needs to be some type of a, you know, a debrief that would be maybe outside of the standard process because that's a key supplier relationship. Great. Uh, the next question is, for organizations outsourcing this to a third party, how are they commercially structuring the external sourcing desk? Is it volume based? Good question. It, yeah, the, most commonly, what we see in terms of commercial model is uh, one of it, it's either one of two. It's um, fixed fee, which is typically more around um, headcount and saying we think we need this many resources. We have this volume of work. We want a dedicated delivery, uh, and therefore we establish a fixed fee type relationship. So that's that's one option. And then the so second option. Is, is more around the volume or what I like to say is pay by the drink, right? This idea of let's, let's define the different types of projects and what would be the level of effort to support those projects. So going back to that idea of maybe simple, standard, and complex, and then let's agree to what the pricing would be um, and let's agree to how many projects could be supported by that, that central sourcing desk, um, you know, over the next, six months, 12 months, whatever, whatever makes sense. So, and that's a little bit more of a variable pricing model versus the fixed fee concept. That's what we most, at least from a Denali perspective, those are the most common commercial arrangements that we have with our clients. 
Thanks, David. And we're going to do one last question. Hopefully we can wrap it up within, we give everybody a few minutes back on their calendar. Um, but this question is, you mentioned central intake and pipeline tracking. Can you expand on the triage process? There seems to be both art and science to this. And how have you seen organizations build this process? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And, and they're right. It is, there is an art and science to it. Um, I, I mean, absolutely, we, we believe strongly in this idea of, of creating a centralized intake. Um, it's a way to, to simplify, the, simplify the engagement model with your business partners. I think many times business partners are confused about where they need to go. Um, and so what's important on the triage is, is really kind of defining the different channels that they may need to push, push things to, right? So being able to, to clearly um, identify where if it is a sourcing request, making sure it gets to that sourcing desk or that sourcing team for execution. If it is something that maybe is more uh, a finance question, needs to be pushed to that finance team, or if it's a legal question, push it to the legal team. I mean, we believe, so at least from a Denali perspective, we think about this much more as a, almost a, a help desk, if you will, um, for anything procurement related. And then based on that, the triage is done to make sure the request gets to the right to the right spot. Um, that's something that we've seen be successful for many of our clients is is creating that help desk or that triage to do the intake and and to do the the, the channel management, if you will. Um, that's something that you know we've got a lot of experience in doing, and 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 many of our clients take advantage of it. <clears throat> Yeah, and the the only thing I'll add on to that, and that's uh, that's that's perfect, David. Uh, for for when you're thinking about it, just outside of maybe just the the, the actual help desk side of it, uh, when when our customers do launch pipeline and intake, because it is a change, it, it's a, it's different. Because obviously, you're managing this process today decentralized with sort of a lot of team members managing their own, or much more or less collaborative. And what we find is, is step one is, is to almost is to take a baby approach to it a little bit, sort of um, where initially instead of jumping in and rolling out. Pick a few core categories that you know you've got interactive stakeholders and actually launch it with a few core groups initially from like IT, or maybe facilities, maybe marketing, ones that are trying to engage the business already today in a pretty set fashion and use that as a way to track how the intake process works with them because it's really easy to configure back and forth and just go through a quarter of it and just sort of see the data around it instead of just rolling out something like categorically for the whole organization. Like this is the new intake form if you need something for sourcing because you're going to go through a few learning moments, especially as you get your first 5, 10, 20 requests in and how they should be routed, what the SLA requirements are, all of those types of things. So we always recommend starting like launching pipeline initially and then opening up intake as a piece of that because that, that conversation is very important and that handoff has got to be handled with a lot of care. So versus opening up the floodgates, like do a handful initially to build that trust. And then the word will spread because you're going to bring stakeholders into every project. So they'll start seeing the benefits of it really quickly. Yep. And then one last question. We did have one come in. Um, this is, how do you make sure that the stakeholders come back to the sourcing desk versus the category manager to mitigate handovers as outlined by Denali? Yeah, I think that's all part of the kickoff process. Um, so what we would recommend is part of project kickoff, you establish those roles and responsibilities for managing the project moving forward. So in some cases, our clients have it where the kickoff call is with the category manager and the Denali um, sourcing lead, and they're, they're, they're managing that together and they're setting those expectations around who will be your focal point through the sourcing process. Um, that's typically a, a best practice that we, we like to establish. In some cases, um, you know, where the, maybe the, the maturity of the, of the category, the maturity of the procurement organization is such that, it, that it, you don't really need to do that, right? And you can just, Denali is well established. They can just say where your sourcing leads through this process and the category manager only needs to be involved on a kind of a, um, uh, an ad hoc basis almost. Um, so typically when we get started, it is more of a, let's do this together until we've established the uh, kind of the, the rapport and the credibility with and the maturity with the stakeholder. 
but usually it moves pretty quickly to where uh, Denali is just an extension of the procurement team. They're not seen as any different than the procurement team in this capacity, and they're managing and being the sourcing lead throughout the process. Great. Well, I want to say thank you to everyone on the webinar for attending, and thanks so much to David and Stan for leading today's webinar. Once again, we'll be emailing the replay shortly, and if anyone has any questions, wants more information on SCOW, or wants, has any questions directly for Stan and David, um, please feel free to replay or reply to that email that I'll be sending out, and I can definitely put you in touch. But just want to say thanks again. Everyone have a great day. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.